Hello, everyone. Welcome to the um, online Geneva Trade and Development Workshop. Uh, the series is jointly organized by CPR, the Geneva School of Economics and Management, uh, the Graduate Institute Geneva, ANCTAD, and the World Trade Organization. Uh, for today's seminar, I'm delighted to welcome Laura Alfaro from Harvard Business School. Laura is both a friend and a co-author, but more importantly, uh, she's a scholar with both a great academic background and publication record and also high level uh, real world policy experience. Laura will be presenting her paper, uh, Currency Hedging in Emerging Markets, Managing Cash Flow Exposure, uh, which is joined with uh, Mauricio Calani and Liliana Varela. And uh, we're happy that uh, they're uh, here with us and uh, they will join in for the Q&A questions. Uh, as usual, the presentation will last one hour and will be followed by uh, 15 minutes Q&A. Uh, during the presentation, feel free to ask questions in the Q&A window and we will pass them uh, on to Laura. Uh, in the final 15 minutes, uh, you can just raise your hand and ask a question directly to, to Laura. So without further ado, uh, Laura, it's, uh, it's really nice to have you here. And uh, we hope to have you soon, uh, not only virtually, but it's, for the moment it's great to have you virtually and the, and the floor is yours. You have one hour. Thanks, Hugo. And yes, uh, thanks for the invitation and, and hopefully next time uh, it will be live in, in Switzerland. Let me share my screen. Is it, is it working? Yes. Okay, so um, as Hugo said, this is co-author work with uh, Mauricio Calani and Liliana Varela. Uh, since Mauricio is part of the Chilean Central Bank, the usual disclaimer applies. Um, the views in this paper does not represent the views of the central bank it's, or its board members. So um, let me start with, with a little bit of a, of a motivation. As you know, and, and I think in this crowd is, is, is uh, well known as, as many of you have worked in, in, in the topic, the, the use of foreign currency is, is a, prevalent in many emerging markets. And here we're talking that uh, many uh, developing countries and emerging markets, you cannot use your own currency to trade. In general, a lot of the trading, in particular in commodities is in dollars, but even also to trade uh, manufacturing, even services, the payment has to, do, has to be done in foreign currency. Uh, for Latin America in particular, it's usually the dollar, but in other countries, it's also the dollar, uh, the, the euro or, or, or others. Um, this is also the case for funding capital markets, bonds, and debts. Uh, this has a, also spurred a very large literature uh, in which, for example, Hugo has also contributed with Aiken Green and Hausmann, which has created the topic of the original scene that we cannot issue in our own debt. We have to issue foreign currency debt. And uh, because of the fact that we cannot trade or fund in our own currency, this creates currency mismatch, mismatches problems. In particular, uh, Guillermo Calvo and Carmen Reinhardt, but again, other authors have coined and the, the concern related with these currency mismatches that relate to policy management, in particular, the fear of floating. So it does limit a lot of the policy options because you're afraid that if you have a big devaluation, the firms that are borrowing in foreign currency may have uh, problems as they may not have a uh, receipts in, in dollars. And so this again has been a concern in many countries again for decades now, and there has been a lot of policy advice. Uh, nowadays, there's a revival of using fixed exchange rates and capital controls. However, there's an alternative uh, solution that is to use the financial markets, the derivative markets to hedge some of these currency mismatches. As it turns out, the derivative market is one of the largest markets in the world. It's the, the amount traded, according to BIS, is close to $6 trillion daily. And in fact, when you study exchange rate markets, 
they are dominated not by spot transactions, but by derivative transactions. So 70% of that daily uh, turnover is in uh, derivatives, financial derivatives, and not in the spot. In emerging markets, there has been uh, impressive growth in the last decades. It, because of the fixed exchange rate, perhaps in the 80s and 90s, there was not a lot of use of financial derivatives, but as countries have embraced floating exchange rate re regimes, this market has developed. It is still, of course, not the size of uh, the market for rich countries, but it has seen impressive growth. And the BES has documented that the growth of derivatives in emerging market is close to 60% in the last three years and is dwarfing the growth in rich countries. The, they estimate that the daily uh, turnover is close to 1.6 trillion for emerging markets, but this is underestimated because the BIS tends to measure mostly over the counter transactions. And there are big markets like, for example, Brazil, that is mostly traded in uh, futures. In, in Brazil, it's close to 50 uh, billion per day. So, so again, there's huge growth in emerging markets. And we argue that they have received relatively less attention. And perhaps these are the markets because of the currency mismatches where it might be a perhaps more important and, and may be a way to solve some of these vulnerabilities. We argue that some of the limitations have been related with data and a, both in rich and emerging. And there's a growth of data in emerging markets in particular that I think allow us to think a little bit better some of these issues. So I think there's um, broad four questions. And now they're in uh, PESA, uh, we have four questions. Um, I would argue we don't really know the answers of some of these questions, even for developed markets, but our paper is gonna focus on developing and emerging markets because this is the data that we have. But in general, we don't know how much firms are exploiting natural hedging. So we know that firms can a hedge using financial derivatives, but they can also engage in operation a hedging. A, they can locate a subsidiaries in foreign countries to deal with the currency mismatches, but they can also try to match receivables and payments. That is, if they receive a payment for exports in foreign currency, they can try to match it to payments in foreign currency related to imports and foreign currency debt. We don't know how much firms exploit these natural hedges. If they don't exploit these natural hedges, how much do they use financial derivatives and which firms use financial derivatives? If they do use financial derivatives, is hedging complete or partial? And more general, how does the development of the financial derivative market and the financial markets in general affect firms' financial decisions and habits? So we're gonna try to tackle these questions, as I said, through the eyes of a very detailed firm, uh, firm level data set from Chile. Uh, the data does start uh, in the end of the 90s, but we're gonna start in 2008 until 2018 because of the different matching requirements. In particular, the data has census level daily foreign currency derivative contracts. Uh, the legislation in Chile is such that every um, derivative transaction, which is mostly done over the counter, over the counter has to be registered. We're gonna match this information with foreign currency debt, bonds and, and loans, and we also have local currency debt. We're gonna match it with detailed custom data on international trade, and most importantly, uh, trade credits, because we're gonna argue that the trade credits are the ones that give you the financial vulnerability of the country. Once your exports and imports are paid, you're not financially vulnerable. Is the if you want responsibilities that come from that trade that are being uh, recorded through these trade credits that give you this financial um, vulnerability. We also have employment and sales from their tax agencies, and most importantly, tax IDs that will allow us to match all of this information. This is a very comprehensive data set of the firm's joint decisions to trade, to borrow, and to use financial derivatives it represents close to 85% of total employment. As you know, many emerging markets, there's a lot of informal sector. In the case of Chile, the data uh, covers 85% of employment, um, which is quite high for an emerging market and in general for, 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 a, for an economy. We're also going to exploit a policy reform 
related to changes in the pension uh, regulation. In, in Chile, the main, one of the main players in the derivative markets are the pension. They were by law required to hedge most of their exposure abroad. The regulation has changed in terms of how much um, exposure they can keep. And we're gonna exploit these changes in regulation as, uh, as if you want supply shocks to the derivative uh, market. Oops. And so from this data, uh, just to give you a preview, we find that in general, natural hedging of currency risk is limited. So even firms that can exploit or potentially we think we, they can exploit are not exploiting. We're gonna argue uh, what is uh, related to the payment uh, timing. We also uh, document that it is larger firms that tend to hedge. Again, this is consistent with findings in the trade literature and in the, in the debt, it tends to be larger firms that trade, larger firms that engage in foreign currency debt. And it's also larger firms that engage in financial derivatives, but they also tend to hedge the larger amounts. So this does speak of a series of fixed costs associated not only with engaging in this market, but also because it's done over the counter, there seems to be additional fixed costs of, uh, per transaction. Firms are more likely to hedge international trade than foreign currency debt. And again, there might be some issues in how we're managing the data. I'm gonna go in detail, but it's broadly mostly used for hedging trade transactions and is mostly to trade gross flows rather than net flows. And we argue again, this, has, this is related to the issue of timing. And we find that firms are more likely to pay a larger premium for longer maturities. In terms of the policy reform, we find that uh, the negative supply shock, uh, the reduction in liquidity does affect firms hedging uh, derivative uh, decisions and increases the forward premium. So in terms of the questions, we tend to find that natural hedging is limited. It tends to be related to cash flows. The is mostly by large firms for operations, mostly in trade. Hedging is incomplete and firms paid larger maturity and the market liquidity does affect firms hedging uh, decisions. Sorry, I by mistake opened the chat and now I need to close the chat, but well. Okay, sorry about that. So there is a broad literature. Um, if you want, there is a first generation of papers that have exploited listed firms. So listed firms by law are required to report to the shareholders and they have been reporting net uh, positions. And so the, if you want the first round of papers have exploited this information and they have found that operational hedging proxy by where you locate your subsidiaries and number of countries and regions is not a good substitute for financial hedging. And again, this does speak of the need to use or, or the potential uh, advantage of financial uh, hedging. They also tend to find that there seems to be uh, economies of scale, some fixed costs. Firms that engage in trading different forms of derivatives, commodities or interest rates are also the ones that are hedged. A interest rate. So again, there seems to be some economies of scale in the management of risk. Uh, of risk. It, we do seem to find, again, th this idea of some fixed cost economies of scale in the use of these uh, instruments, which again may be related to the fact that they're mostly over the counter. We also tend to find that it's, prevent, it's mostly firms that use it for trade rather than a uh, debt. Uh, but again, our transaction uh, level data also does suggest that this hedging is a partial. And also even firms that are engaged in trade and debt tend to use it for gross exposures and not net exposures, as we usually tend to think about uh, how firms may be engaging in this market. And as we're gonna show, and again, exposed, this is obvious to all of us, the, the, the rationale for this is because the timing of operation and financial milestones are not the same. So the day we sign a contract, we pay the contract, we produce and we deliver, 
they're all different. And we argue that this is key to understand the day uh, to day use of financial derivatives. Um, perhaps because we tend to use customs data, we tend to think that at the end of the year, the good exported and the good imported come and they get paid. But again, there's a different timing of all of these uh, transactions. The other is that we tend to forget that there are still a lot of transactions that are being done in local currency. And so even though uh, there's uh, exporting and importing and debt in foreign currency, funds still need to pay taxes, wages, and other obligations. And in most countries, even heavily dollarized countries, uh, these still tend to be done in domestic currency. And so this is why firms are, are thinking about these exports and imports separately and hedging gross uh, transactions. This is also why even natural hedging may render firms vulnerable to currency fluctuations associated to the working capital. More generally, uh, the paper does speak about the value of hedging. In terms of optimality, the optimal use of hedging perhaps is a little bit uh, complex. If we think of a world with no uh, transaction cost and no capital market imperfections, Firms shouldn't hedge anything. Shareholders should uh, create a well-diversified portfolio and there shouldn't be a uh, concern. A an alternative view thinks that no, firms should hedge everything that is not core part of their activity and so they should hedge exchange rates. There's an in-between that in the world where we have different capital market uh, imperfections, financial transactions, information asymmetries, transaction costs, there might be a uh, value of hedging, but again, it may not necessarily be optimal to hedge uh, completely. And there's a very nice paper by Fruit, Stein, and, and Scheifstein that does speak about this uh, optimality of, of, of hedging in the world of uh, imperfect transactions. Our work um, contributes to this literature, and we do find that this timing, which we can think of a capital market imperfection, is associated with the need of uh, hedging. More general, there's a, it's a large literature on the role of financial intermediaries in shaping exchange rates. And we do find that there is an important role of the pension funds in Chile, not only in creating, but also uh, if you want uh, sustaining the thickness of, of this market. So in terms of the presentation, um, I'm going to start with some background data, the four main stylized facts, and then I'm going to detail uh, into this supply shock, the regulatory change in the pension fundings in Chile. So let me start uh, with a description of the data. So we're gonna use, as I said, uh, if you want a census of that daily transactions in Chile, that data has been collected since 1997. We're gonna start after 205 because of um, the matching with other data sets. Uh, as I mentioned, this was a requirement by law. And so every single uh, derivative transaction in Chile has to be registered through uh, the central bank. These transactions, uh, they're over the counter and they have to be done through the banks. For the purposes of the paper, we're going to use a derivatives that have maturity greater than seven days. This is because we're gonna to have to match with other data whose frequency is not as high. Uh, and so we, just to deal with this, uh, the rollover of these uh, small uh, derivatives, we, we, we're just gonna exclude them. This is close to 1.5% of the sample. So, so it's not changing significantly our sample. We're gonna match with foreign currency debt uh, data uh, the Chileans uh, record uh, foreign currency um, debt in bonds, in, in loans, uh, FDI. This data is recorded at the monthly level. And so uh, we're going to start matching data at the end of uh, the month. We also have through the credit registry domestic debt. The Chileans have kept track of very detailed custom data. Uh, this is a monthly census uh, of all uh, trade transactions. It's at the pure operation level. More importantly for us, it includes trade credit. So the Chileans record whether you export the percentage that you 
uh, got paid now, the percentage you're gonna pay later. If you import the percentage you pay now, the percentage you pay later, and also who's giving you this trade credit, if it's the, the, your customer, your supplier, or whether it's a bank. So, so we use this information. We also have currency invoicing. Uh, most of the trade in Chile is in, in, in dollars, close to 80%. Uh, increasingly, uh, uh, some of the trade that has been done with uh, the European Union is increasingly in euros, but in our in our data, it's mostly dollars. We also have a census level data of the firm at uh, the firm level of sales sector, age, and uh, number of workers. We're going to merge this data using tax IDs and. Uh, this took a while, but we managed to, from the tax authorities, uh, get this information. In the case of Chile, every individual has a tax ID. And with this uh, tax ID, you can link individuals to firms. Um, and this, is, this was important to us because we want not the establishment, we want the firms. So it could be that a conglomerate through some establishments performs the manufacturing, a different one may be doing the exporting and importing, and a third one may be doing the financial transactions. And so we want to have the whole firm, if you want. And through the use of a, a, these tax IDs, we were able to create firms, uh, if you want to think of them conglomerates, but, but firms. So we aggregated establishments at the family level, which we're gonna call firms. As I said, the data is at the end of the month. I mentioned the sample is uh, close to 85% of dependent employment and financial derivatives uh, they use is close to 26% of employment. Any given year, we have to close to 30,000 firms, 105 in total, of which 1,300, 7,300 in general use financial derivatives throughout this period. We argued that one advantage of using Chile, apart from the detail uh, data quality, to the best of my knowledge, it's, it's hard to find this, this level of information uh, match at the tax ID level. One advantage is throughout this period, uh, Chile had a relatively stable macro environment, a relatively stable debt, and so no crisis was fueled by domestic concerns. And so the financial decisions the financial hedging decisions of the, of the firms are not per se driven by domestic concerns, but because of the external environment. This is also a period with relatively low um, CIP violations. There was a small period through uh, the financial, the, the Great Recession, but in general, Chile is a, is a country that displays very small CIP violations. The market is dominated by over-the-counter transactions, this is also the case in most rich countries. So in that sense, is representative. Uh, in emerging markets, the one that gets dominated by futures is the case of Brazil. But as I mentioned, most derivative markets all over the world are over the counter. This is also a country uh, where financial transactions dominate both transactions, which is also the case in developed countries. Financial derivatives dominate interest rate derivatives. And for us, this is an advantage because you can emulate some form of um, a hedging, exchange rate hedging through interest rates, but in the case of Chile, it's done directly through the financial exchange uh, derivatives. So this is the growth of uh, the market throughout this year. Um, you see the increase in terms of volume, uh, close to uh, 40 billion. Uh, this is just the firms. If we add pensions and banks, the market is close to 100 uh, billion. And you see here the growth of number of firms. And here we're plotting with and without uh, multinationals. And, and I'll say a little bit more about the samples that we're using. In terms of the data, we have to close to 2 million contracts. Of these contracts, close to 725 are with one non-financial firm counterparty. In general, I'm now going to refer to non-financial firms as just firms, the real sector firms, which is going to be the focus of our sample. A, as you can see, out of these 725,000, close to 500,000, are purchases, uh, firms uh, trying to hedge and lock the value of the dollar. 
while 200,000 are sales, firms trying to lock, if you want, the value of the peso. The market is dominated by cohorts. As I mentioned, this is a usual the case. We do have a little bit of futures, but it's not a, really a, a lot. We have some swaps. Um, usually swaps tend to, be, tend to be more complex and used for debt. Uh, so what we're gonna do in the samples is we're going to run regressions first with four words and we're gonna add swaps just uh, to be sure that we have a main specification that, ha that adds apples to apples and then we're gonna add swaps. So in terms of uh, how we perform this analysis, as I said, we're gonna focus on non-financial firms uh, we're going to drop uh, transactions less than seven days. We are going to present analysis with and without multinationals because these multinationals, they can use operations abroad as an operational hedging, but also it can be that a subsidiary abroad or an entity abroad is the one performing the derivatives and we won't be able to see this in our sample, in, 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 in our data. So we're going to show you results with and without multinationals. As is typical, most of the firms are domestic, close to 10% are multinationals. Uh, Chile tends to be dominated by copper. Copper is also one that you can't just hedge the, the price of the copper. So we're going to show you a main sample without copper, and we're going to add uh, the copper that is 244 firms, close to 4,500 contracts. We're also going to show you subsets of firms that export, firms that import, and firms that do both. In the case of Chile, most firms that export import, but not all firms that import export. Think here retail. There's a lot of retail that imports, and they're also asking for derivatives. We are also going to show you firms that ask for foreign currency debt. Um, there's a lot of firms that export and import or have trade and a uh, borrow abroad, but not all firms that borrow abroad have trade. And so we're also going to have a subset of only debt and debt and trade. And we also are going to cut debt in different uh, maturities as the financial commitments uh, may change depending on whether your debt matures in six months, one year or, or more. So we're going to cut the data in uh, these different ways. As I also told you, we're going to have with and without swaps, and we're going to focus on dollar hedging, which is close to 85% of the sample dollar transactions and dollar hedging, but in the robustness, we are additional uh, currencies. Laura, we have a couple of questions. So there is one question from uh, Francis Kramar, uh, and two questions from me. So let me start at the one with Francis. Uh, so Francis is asking if there is a way to measure uh, ISIS payment incidents. I think it, it relates to defaults, so that there are uh, so uh, central bank probably might might connect might collect data on these large uh, non payments for either firms that default or that for other reasons they don't pay. Uh, and the the question whether if you have data on this and if this is uh, relevant for you. Uh, so that's one question. And one related question from me, uh, if you have information on counterparty risk and if this is, uh, again, relevant and it's something you consider. Uh, and the second question from me uh, is, um, so when I look at options uh, on, the, on the purchase side, side uh, you know, the purchases of uh, call and put, it's about the same. But when I look at sales, uh, non-financial firms uh, seem to sell more uh, call than put. And I don't know if this is something that you look at it or we do look later in the paper. Yeah, so, so let me start with the last one. R right now we haven't exploited that call and put. Um, Relative to forwards, it, it, they're not that many, but, but it's a good idea and, and, and we can look at that. In terms of the default and counterparty risk, uh, the data does have this information. What, what I was not clear is, are you concerned about default and counterparty risk in the debt or the payment of the derivative? So I, I, I don't know what Francis uh, had in mind because I'm just relating your question. So I guess his question is just if uh, you're collecting data on this and you're using data in, uh, in any way, but uh, Francis, you can send me an email 
if you have more uh, I'm checking my messages and um, my my question about counterparty risk is that you know uh, I guess one of your results that there is no perfect hedging and you know I guess if there is counterparty risk it might reduce the incentive of people to to hedge so that that's uh, one question so, so I assume you're asking a the non the delivering or the payment of the derivative and exactly, not in yeah, general. Yeah. So in the case of Chile, the market developed as, as, as non-deliverables because of the capital control. The payment is basically done in the defense and it could be done in local currency, not necessarily in foreign currency. In, in the case of Brazil, so you can always settle in, in local currency. But, but in the case of Chile, it, the market started to develop before they got rid of the capital controls. And because of this non-derivable, the counterparty risk is, is lower uh, because you're just settling the defense. So it's a little bit, if you want, like. Additionally, it's done through the banking system. So when it usually happens, you have a trade transaction, that, that usually the bank comes and offers. It, that, the, and so the, the fact that there's a combo also diminishes a little bit the default risk. But if you don't pay, which the data does keep track, you immediately have a liability with the bank. And then you start going through the normal process of um, a, having to pay this, this debt. So far, we haven't a, exploited this data. We, we had a quick look because we had a question on this last week. Th there doesn't seem to be a lot of non-payment precisely because of the way it's done, uh, non-derivables and banking. But, but we do have a, a, a flag that this is something we, we need to, to, to study a little bit more. It, just in general, the BIS has documented that there has been increased concern of the non-payment of derivatives. And this is why in most emerging markets, there is a movement in general to these non-deliverables that do have lower uh, counterparty risk in, in terms of payment. So, so, so one other clarification question, Laura, and then a follow-up from uh, Francis. So uh, Tamara Terracciano from the University of Geneva uh, is asking whether you think if you can clarify how you compute non-financial uh, effect exposure if you only do it uh, via trade credit. And, um, and Francis Kramatis clarifies following up. Uh, he's saying that imperfect hedging uh, might lead to a payment risk. Uh, so. I, yeah, let, let me hold on on both because it is a fact. I'm going to explain a little bit more how we do the exposure, but, of, but it is a fact that if you don't hedge everything, you have a risk. The question is whether it's optimal to hedge everything. And, and that's the part that is not clear uh, to me. Um, as I have said in previous presentations, sometimes we economists tend to think as central bankers and we want firms to have absolutely no risk. But if firms have no risk, they don't grow, they don't uh, do anything. So, so anyone who has taught MBAs does know that if they go and tell them, uh, do you take, would you like a firm to have zero risk? They would immediately say no. Um, I mean, you make money is through leverage and some risks. And, and so again, the, the optimality is a, is a little bit more, more complex. Um, and, and, and I'll say a little bit more as, as I go through the, through the results. Super, thanks, Laura. Okay, so, so let me start, and, and this does lead to the question of, of how we're measuring um, the exposure. So as I said, firms may have uh, operational financial exposure and so you may have cash flows that uh, imply in some payments of dollars and uh, some, some um, liabilities in dollars. So usually the way we think about this is if your pay payables and receivables are matched, then you should be naturally hedged. And so we check these using trade credits. The reason why we use trade credits is because once it's paid, you already have the money. There is this thing that in general, for example, you got paid in, in dollars, you can save those dollars in a little box, but that is self-saving, that's self-insurance. That, that is not really what natural hedging is about. You can also ask for a loan and put all that money in a little box and, and pay with that. 
But again, that, that is not natural hedging, that is self-insurance. We checked in general firms, and, and we all know this from the, um, from the COVID crisis, uh, firms don't tend to have more than six months of a money saving a little box to pay activities. And I say six months, that really large firms. In the case of Chile, medium and large firms didn't have more than three months, uh, four months uh, of uh, liquid assets to be able to pay all the liquid um, obligations. So, so again, in general, firms don't tend to self-insure. If you think about it, self-insuring is just expensive. There's an opportunity cost of having your money in a little box. But what we think about natural hedging is not self-insurance, is whether your payables and receivables are matched. And that's why we argue that it does relate to the payments to exports and imports and the trade credits, which gives you the difference of how much you receive and how much you still need to, to pay. So we do a first simple correlation. And again, these are just simple correlations where we, where we match the trade credit from exports against the trade credit from imports and the currency debt. I'm going to show you results here where we use all the, the debt, but in the, in the robustness, we have cut debt by maturities. Because again, if you have a 30-year loan, you may not want to hedge everything right now. You may want to wait. You may just want to hedge some of the payments that are due uh, soon. And again, the optimality of hedging debt is, is more complicated. Um, and, and I'm going to get more into this as I go to some of the results. Uh, all the variables, uh, we also use for me fixed effect and we saw in some industry and years fixed effect and, and we close to is a, at the firm level. So if a firm is naturally hedged, then alpha should be equal to one. Your receivables and your payments in dollars, they should all match at the same uh, time frame. We're doing this at the firm I month M. And what we find is the simple correlation without a fixed effects will give you 10%, 12% in some cases. Uh, once we add firm series effects, the coefficients are in general statistic, uh, um, statistically significant, but economically they're very small. We get that the matching is close to 2% when we look imports and exports. Uh, we drop mining just in case if mining uh, might be driving this result, we get very similar. Uh, results. We look at also what happens with debt, and again, is is very small. As I mentioned, we cut the data at firms that only trade, that only do uh, trade and derivatives, uh, trade and foreign currency debt. We add mining. We get rid of mining. We get rid of multinationals. We add multinationals. We look at firms that export and import, and we cannot get these coefficients to be larger than ten percent in in any case. And again, we played with this. A lot recently, we were asked maybe not to do it just at monthly level. We did it at the quarterly level, and we also did it at a yearly level, and we still cannot get these coefficients to be uh, economically uh, significant. We restricted a little bit more, and we just looked at the cash flow that were maturing thing, maturing at the same date. Again, this is perhaps a more restrictive exercise. And again, we cannot get these numbers to be quantitatively big. We can get them to be statistically significant, but quantitatively, these are very small uh, numbers. And again, we just don't get any coefficient to be greater than 10%, uh, even without using firm fixed effect. And what we argue is that, and again, uh, this, this may not be, a, this may be kind of obvious, and is that th there is just very, the timing, the maturity of these payments just doesn't match. So this here, we, we show the maturity of imports, trade credit is close to three months, of exports, four months, foreign currency debt, uh, four years. Again, there's a lot of variability in this matching. So, so if you're going to be the, 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 the person doing financial hedging in this firm, it's a headache to try to match these dates. If you think about the case of Chile, they probably also don't have a lot of a possibility to change these maturity dates. Depending on the product that you're selling, they have their natural cycle. You either need to wait for it to get out of the ground, you need to wait for Christmas to come and then you sell. There is a lot of seasonality in a lot of the products we sell. And so it may make it hard to change 
the maturity and the maturity of a uh, payment. And because of this, it might be just easier to start thinking to hedge these different maturities through financial derivatives and not through what we tend to call a natural uh, hedging. And, and again, I think this is perhaps in trade, we tend to think customs data and customs data, we see the product, but we need to start thinking, okay, when was this contract signed, when it was produced and when it was delivered? And these are all very different dates. An example is now there's this, um, there's not enough cars in the US for the demand. And so a lot of this has to be done with uh, supply shortage and so on and so forth. But another reason is that when they were requesting that demand, the chip takes a long time to produce. They just didn't think there was going to be this crazy demand for cars. So now they, they just cannot fix that. Again, th there is this maturity that does affect a production payment and, and deliverable. And we argue this explains a, this, even firms that could naturally hedge, they don't tend to do it. Here we plot what we call the coincidence of cash flows. And again, for the mean and media firm, it's just very low. So in general, it's just very hard to make these things a match. So then this opens the possibility for financial derivatives to reduce some of these vulnerabilities. Then we, we go and look, okay, uh, given that there is opportunity to perhaps reduce vulnerability with derivatives, which are the firms that are doing this? And in general, what we tend to find is that is the larger firms. And we cut this in different ways. It is the larger firms in terms of employment. It is the larger firms in terms of sales. It is the larger firms in terms of exports and imports. And it is the larger firms in terms of debt. So again, this does speak to some of the results from Melitz and, and the trade literature that there seems to be a different thresholds in which we see firms engaging in different trade activities, but also a debt and derivatives. Um, we, I'm showing you 2006 and 2016, just to give you two snapshots, but it tends to be relatively stable in terms of that this is uh, related to the larger firms. It doesn't seem to be particularly driven by exchange rate fluctuations. Uh, it tends to be uh, the larger firms who, who engage in the derivative market. We checked at the contract level which operations tend to be hedged. And of course, this is not straightforward because as we know, it's not that the contract tells you what is it that they're hedging or what is the purpose of the hedge. After all, funds are always fungible. You can use them for, someone, for something else. So what we did is we focus on export and import transactions, which do tend to have the timing a little bit closer when you uh, engage in the contract and you deliver, as I said many times, because the bank is the one that is providing the trade credit. And so we match this uh, at the, for exports imports at the month level uh, for each contract. And we looked at the amounts that were getting hedged. In general, we tend to find that it's close to double the amounts that are getting hedged, uh, both for exports and uh, for imports. Uh, so again, in general, we tend to find that it's larger firms are hedged and they tend to hedge larger amounts. Um, this was just a, a simple plot. Again, the these are correlations. What we, again, do see is that in general, it is these larger amounts that tend to be hedged. We exploit a little bit more and try to look at the extensive and intensive margin of, hu uh, of the use of derivatives. And so here we use, whether a firm uses derivative or not at the extensive margin, whether they use it at the intensive margin, and here we put the positions. And again, we control for firm and a different industry year fixed effects. So in terms of the use, we do find that in general is firms that export and import that tend to use derivatives. For that, we, we found a, interesting results. Uh, we don't tend to find in general that firms that borrow in foreign currency are the ones that are using or demanding a lot of the derivatives, at least in the extensive margin. And again, we played with some of these maturities. And uh, as I said, there might be different reasons. One is optimality. Um, one way to think about it, if you're a firm that likes the carry trade, you're going to hold the carry trade. You're not going to get rid of the advantage of the carry trade uh, buying a financial derivative. 
An alternative way to think about it, and again, this does come from the paper from Fruit, Stein, and Sharpstein, is if you're if there are capital market imperfections, you may be borrowing to uh, increase investment or working capital, which is uh, mostly related to trade exports and imports. But if you're doing for investment, you may want to engage in a financial derivative in the case where you're worried that if something goes wrong, you don't have enough funds to carry out your investment, but that investment has to be productive. So that means that it's not always the case that you wanna carry, if you want funds to states of the world where you don't think that investment is gonna be productive. And, and it does seem to suggest that, that the optimality of hedging and debt may not be so straightforward. Again, as central bankers, we want everything to be uh, riskless, but that is not necessarily the case from a firm point of view. When we look at the intensive margin, we're finding that exporters sell the dollar while the importers are the one buying in the dollar. So usually the literature interprets exporters selling the dollar as exporters are speculating. And again, we cannot know this because we don't know what they're using with the data, the, the, the derivative. But we actually argue that it is related to the fact that firms still have a lot of local currency commitments. So if you're an exporter and you only got paid 10%, you want to lock the value of the peso because you're going to have to pay workers, you're going to have to pay rent, you're going to have to pay taxes. So alternatively, one explanation of the exporter selling the dollar is that they're just trying to hedge their cash flow exposure. And so exporters are going to sell uh, the dollar. When we look at importers, a, 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 sorry, at purchases, this is mostly importers. We do tend to find that the importers are the ones a, that are locking the value of the dollar, again, related to the fact that they only pay 10% of the value of their imports in foreign currency. And so they want to hedge the value of uh, their the cash flow. A, and so they lock the value of uh, the dollar. We tend to find once we use additional uh, controls, um, this, this number of debt is a little bit significant at 15%. Once we break it a little bit more in maturity periods, we do find some evidence that at a shorter maturity at, at 10%, some of the debt gets hedged. But again, not, not over longer term maturities. Again, this is significant. It's a little bit lower, but again, it does feel that some of the uh, debt does engage in some form of hedging, but it's not as clear as what they're doing for exporting and importing. And as I said, again, it, because of these different timings, what we observe is that firms are thinking of exports and imports separately. If you plot the exporter credits and the short positions and the imports and long positions, the correlations are extremely high. The correlation for exports and Financial derivatives is close to 0.73. For imports and long positions is 0.84. When you plot net positions, it falls to 0.44. So again, it does feel that firms are just thinking about exports and imports separately, and they hedge the positions in exports uh, and the different the imports. So again, this does suggest that these firms are using the dollar because of network effects, because this is the currency that is used in international markets, but not per se because there's an intrinsic value of this dollar. Because if you think about it, alternative, these firms could just be thinking in dollars and they could change all the positions in dollars. And that's not what they're doing. They're changing all the positions and thinking still in local uh, currency. So, so again, they do seem to be thinking in gross and not in net. Then- um, uh, Laura, can, can I, there are a couple of questions here. And they might be related to this fourth point. So maybe I'll, I'll, I'll tell you about it and then you, you might answer to this. So there is a clarification question by uh, Fadia Sam, uh, which is asking whether you're just considering hedging in uh, foreign exchange revenues and foreign exchange cost. But my understanding is you, you, you also include that. So, but, so maybe that's, you could clarify that. And then there is a question by uh, Laszlo Alpern, who is, uh, who is asking a little bit, which I think something you will discuss now, uh, is, uh, is related to the duration of foreign currency debt. And I, he's suggesting that might be 
uh, only uh, hedging on short-term foreign currency debt should be more important than uh, on longer-term currency debt. At least that's my understanding of the question. And the third question is whether uh, you know if there is uh, price discrimination in the uh, over-the-counter forward markets. Uh, so this is uh, being asked by Tamaro Terracciano is uh, suggesting that there is such price discrimination in the European Union in which larger firms get better prices and therefore are more likely to hedge because uh, hedging is cheaper. So, so, so let, me, let me just uh, start with, we do control for foreign currency debt. So, so FCD is foreign currency debt. So, so we do think you might get paid in dollars through exports and you may need dollars to pay imports and foreign currency debt. And, and my apologies for using the dollar and not the euro as an example, because in the case of Chile, it's mostly uh, the dollar, but you're Swiss, so you also don't care about the euro anyways. <laughs> uh, so we, we do can't use... tell the central bankers, <laughs> they can't. Yes. Uh, so we here, I, I'm always afraid when I use these links because they sometimes mess up everything. We do open up the foreign currency debt a little bit. Um, and we find some evidence, uh, this is from seven months to one year, um, and also the very, very long, but, but it's not, it's, it's, it's again, when we add everything, uh, we, we, we had to add all the firms, multinationals, mining, swaps, and, and we get some. When, when we exclude some of these firms, it's not always significant. And again, it, it was not for super short-term debt, and, and but, but we can get some stars if you want. Uh, quantitatively, it's not super big also. But in general, we, 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 we do get larger numbers for import and exports, lower for debt. I am willing to admit that uh, the, the matching of the data is more complex for debt. And a lot of the debt is done with swaps where are more complex contracts. And, and so we're, we're, we're playing a little bit more with this. The, the data does tell us not only the maturity, but how much you have to pay the full amount and how much you have to pay each month. And so we're trying to play a little bit more with this. Still, I found it interesting that the evidence does suggest that derivatives are more for trade than foreign currency debt. Um, let me then now go to a little bit of the other question of the price discrimination. We, we look at the, if you want the, the forward premium and the maturity, the way to measure this forward premium is just how much you paid for the contract minus the spot market. We look at each contract, we control for firm and bank because there might be something in the interaction of the firm of the bank. And we also control for uh, maturity. And we do tend to find some evidence that the longer maturity, when you buy, when you purchase, it pays a penalty. And the longer maturity when you sell, which will go on the opposite side, does pay a penalty. We find that there's a little bit of advantage when you purchase, uh, when these sales is the, 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 the sale volume of the firm. So, so it's a proxy for the firm size. So firms, larger firms, do tend to get a little bit of a discount when they purchase. When we control for employment, it's not significant. So, so it does seem to be that they are more worried about the volume of the size of the firm that per se is the number of workers. We get a little bit of discount in the amount if it's a larger amount, but for purchases, we don't seem to get a lot of action for sales. So, so again, it does seem that they, they prefer larger uh, exporters that are doing larger transactions. But, but we don't get a lot of actions for, for importers. So there does seem to be some sense of price discrimination and, and that might be related to, to the question. Again, think about this market. This market has not only a transaction cost of trying to think how I'm gonna set my derivative office, but every transaction you have to sign a contract. And, and it does seem to be affecting a, in terms of a, how this is done. It, it does seem to be putting some, some transaction costs although mostly for larger uh, purchases than, than for sales. So, so then in the last five minutes, or do I have a little bit more? 
we try to finish on time. So if you want to take, oh. take a couple of minutes extra, it's okay, but okay. not and, too much. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and I apologize. My apologies for imposing my Latinness on your Swiss uh, time restriction. I'm as Latin as you. <laughs> so again, this market, as I said, uh, is dominated by uh, pensions and, and, and banks. Um, in general, every financial system does impose this restriction that banks are not allowed to be currency mismatched in, in gross numbers. So most banks do need to hedge their currency uh, risk. So every time I see a paper that says that the banks had a lot of currency risk, then you know that that's a paper written about a bank in 1970s. Because in Latin America, after all our crisis in the 80s and 90s, every single financial system does impose regulation that banks have to cannot hold a lot of currency risk. And thus you see a lot of banks paying in this market, but also you see pensions. So in general, banks and, and, and the real sector tend to buy the dollar while the pension funds tend to sell uh, the dollar. And so we're gonna explore the change in the regulation in Chile. The Chile's, uh, the Chile, when they said the pension fund, it was very conservative and, and very restrictive in terms of when they could go abroad and when they were allowed to grow abroad, they had to, a, a hedge all the currency risk and little by little they were allowed to hold some of the currency risk. So we're going to explore the change that happened in 2012. In May they announced this policy. As you know when you do regulation you have to open to consultation. After one month of consultation it was approved in 2012 and enforced in, two, in December uh, uh, 2012. So again since this market is over the counter every transaction has to go through a bank. The bank may have demand for their own, but they also need to sell to pensions and firms. So the way we're gonna think about it is the pensions are selling mostly dollar net to the banks. They hold some of it, but they are also selling some to the firm. So when the pension funds don't want to sell a lot of exposure because they don't have to anymore, some of, them, some of it is gonna be absorbed by the banks, but the banks also are gonna pass some of these to the firms. So this is the regulation change that we're gonna exploit. Because of confidentiality reasons, I cannot show you the names of the banks or the weights, nor I can show you the name of the pensions and their weights. And my apologies, but this is a restriction of the central bank, but you can see that this is the day the regulation was announced. There might have been a little bit of adjusting but then after the regulation passed, the, the sales of derivatives uh, it went down dramatically. We're going to compare the pre-announcement and the post-announcement. So before May 2012 and after May 2012. We have different strategies and I'm gonna go quickly over them. The first one, we just do a simple comparison before and after and the use of derivatives, as I said before the announcement after the announcement. And we do find that there is a change, a significant change in the, in the standing, but also on the growth. So uh, this is just, if you want a computation of what we see in the graph. So the, there was a negative shock in terms of uh, this market six months before and six months after. Uh, we're going to exploit the fact that since this has to be over the counter, it's done through banks. So we're gonna look at the change in derivatives using firm fixed effects and bank fixed effects. So if a firm all of a sudden is being offered less derivatives from a bank than from another one, we do know that this has to be a shock in the bank because we're holding the firm constant. Again, this is a methodology that Amity and Weinstein have used for bank credits. We can apply it to derivatives because of the fact that it's intermediated through uh, the bank. So we care about these bank shocks, the bank fixed effects. So the first thing we do is we plot this firm, this bank fix effect against the exposure they have through the pensions. And again, I cannot show you names and positions because of confidentiality reasons. There are not that many, so, so you know who they are. But there is a negative and significant effect between the banks that were more exposed to the pensions that adjusted more because they didn't need to go abroad. So there is a passing from the pensions to the banks. And then when I look at the exposure of the banks, so I do find that banks that represent 90% of the share 
of the sales to firms and the purchases uh, of the, the firm activity, they all experience negative supply shocks. This is true for all firms, and this is also true for firms in trade. So the banks not only uh, they adjusted a little bit, but they passed and they were selling less to firms. We also find that the banks that had negative supply shocks in terms of uh, how much they pass to firms are also the ones that are now charging a little bit more in terms of forward premium. Uh, although this just uh, goes perhaps uh, is relevant for like 80% of the market. So the firms, the banks that were more exposed sold less to the firms and also charged a little bit more. So in terms of effects, we do find that is a, a significant uh, effect for firms in terms of the purchases and the forward premium. We look a little bit what this meant in terms of the firm uh, uh, hedging strategies, and we do find that there is less hedging of this negative shock and also in the extensive margin and also in the intensive margin. Something that we found that was interesting is that we expected importers to be negatively affected but we also find exporters to be negatively affected. So, so importers cannot buy more, but it also seems to suggest that exporters decided to sell less. And the way we're thinking about this is, is the typical uh, model thickness. Um, so, so the firms were selling and buying, and, and it was easy if you want to find a match. The moment that you cannot find as easily someone to sell, then uh, to buy, then you're also not going to sell. This is a little bit what is happening in the, the real estate market in the US. There's just not a lot of sales. And so there is also not, uh, there's just uh, not enough. And so you also see a constraint on the other side. Again, if you cannot buy a, a buyer, then you also see a restriction in the seller if you think that there are search costs and, and mapping. And, and, and we want to um, develop a little bit more the model in trying to think of some of the effects of these shocks in, in, the, in the thickness and the development of these financial markets. So I hurried a little bit, but hopefully this will allow for questions. So uh, we do merge these different data sets and provide different stylized facts in the use of hedging by firms. And we find a... Um, that the, that the, the timing of payables and receivables do play an important role in the choices of financial derivatives and exposure. And we exploit this liquidity shock, uh, is this supply shock in the market, and argue that these liquidity shocks do find, do have effects on firm hedge activities. Thanks, and sorry for going a little bit over. It was, uh, at the end, it was perfect. Uh, so now, uh, so this is a great paper. We now have uh, 15 minutes for for uh, for Q and A. So uh, all the people uh, who are uh, participating, uh, if you want to ask a question, just use your uh, raise hand button, and uh, and then uh, we will ask you to unmute yourself and ask your question. So let me just make sure that I have the full list uh, of participants. So there is a question from uh, Fadi Hassan. Fadi, unmute yourself and go ahead. Thank you, Hugo, and, and thank you, Laura, for, for the presentation. It's, it's really a terrific paper. I, I just have a couple of, of, uh, of curiosity and just some clarification. One is in terms of the stylized facts and whether you have looked at, at how firms hedging uh, change or might change when the peso experience, you know, a prolonged period of appreciation versus depreciation. Obviously, these effects are, are absorbed by, by your fixed effects, but uh, you know whether you have tried some sample split given that between 2005 and 2008, there was a prolonged period of pesos appreciation, and then between 2013 and 15, a, pe a period of depreciation. So whether something changed, that's one question. And, and, and the other is, is uh, was related to Tamaro's points at the beginning when uh, you know, your measure of, of non-financial effects exposure is related on trade credit, and you explain why you think about that as, a, as you know, the right way to think in terms of natural hedging. But I, I was wondering, like, in terms of overall potential cash flow mismatch between revenues and, and costs, uh, 
So also counting the money that you put in the box, like, you know, to use the terminology you used, what's, uh, what's the overall, uh, you know, effects uh, uh, mismatch between, between, uh, between the revenues and, and, and costs that Chilean firms uh, typically experience. Thank you very much. So, so do we collect questions or, or I answer? I was muted. Go, go ahead, Laura. So uh, uh, just to clarify, we do use exports and uh, financial uh, debt and, and foreign currency debt uh, in terms of the whole cash flow. I, I also have workers, but I don't have for all of our firms, the full financial balance sheet. So I don't know how much they're paying in rent, taxes, so on and so forth. We have for a subset of the larger firms balance sheet information, and, and we have used that information, and, it, and our results seem to be similar. As I said, in general, firms just do not hold that much um, cash flow. Um, they, they don't hold that much money in, in, in a little box. We all know this from the from the the pandemic. A concern by all central banks was the liquidity of firms, and many firms what they did they started to borrow at to hold cash precisely because of that. But but in general they don't don't tend to to hold it. And we can show the results for the for the larger firms that do have balance sheets and, and they are uh, similar. But but I I do want to stress that that is not what we think as natural hedging. That is just operational hedging. And, and there are many ways in which we can do operational hedging. But natural hedging is that, that is much export, import, and, and, and payable. And in terms of the exchange rate, uh, so here we, we show this little line red is the exchange rate. Um, and so you do see that in periods where there is a appreciation, you do see a little bit more activity. And in depreciation, you see a little bit less activity in terms of number of firms, and also it uh, correlates a little bit uh, with the growth positions. But we were shocked that it was not as dramatic as, as we would have thought exactly. And, and this is what we wanna move uh, later. We want to exploit a little bit more the time series, but, but it's not as dramatic as, as I would have expected exactly. There, there does seem to be some more stable trends. Any Thank other you. any other question? If nobody has a question, I have a question myself. I don't see any hand, so I'll ask you my question now. <laughs> so so this is uh, so this is oh now I see that somebody else has a question. So I, I I'll uh, I'll ask my question quickly and then I, I give the floor to Francis. Uh, so um, you know about fifteen or more years ago with uh, with uh, Arturo Galindo and, and other people we're trying to get type of data like you have. And so we're very jealous. So we would, you know, we're trying to, to build this currency exposure and try to find data on edging and we couldn't find anything. And at that point we want, so we did a research network at the IDB. We have few countries, but our data uh, are much worse than what you have. But what we're trying to do at that point is trying to understand uh, the consequences of this exposure in terms of investment or in terms of firm's outcome. And I think what you have now, you know, it's fantastic because you have uh, number one this very detailed information on hedging you have a policy shock so you are in the perfect so i was asking you uh, i wanted to ask you whether a, a, in the next step you're going to use this data to see how, how this uh, different hedging position and this shock are going to affect uh, firm performance yes this is what we want to move uh, next the the effects we are the reason we still don't have it is we also want to look at the, the domestic credit. Because again, one way to think about this is you hedge because you want to maintain some stable cash flow to do perform your activities, the, the payment of uh, workers, so on and so forth, and your investment. We, we just want to check how much firms are able to access credit lines as, a, as an alternative way to deal with this cash flow management. And, and this is just taking a, a little bit, but once we complete that, the whole picture, if you want of all the credits they can get, we, we can get into a little bit more the, the effects. 
Super. So Francis Kramart has a question. Please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Lara. Very interesting. As you may know, I'm mostly a labor trade economist, very little a financial guy, but I'm all, so I'm very much in the line of uh, Hugo when I'm asking uh, the questions I was asking, do we see real outcomes? And, and the question would be, because you have this risk, sometimes you can pay, sometimes you can face problems and take two firms that have, one is hedging well, you know, using imports and exports, the other do, doing not the right thing. Do we see real things? Uh, and particularly if you think about what happened, so we're in Switzerland at the moment, there was a big shift in, in the exchange rate at some point, and some firms might have been exposed. Do we see that those who did the right thing better behave later? I mean, there are yeah, results, profits, employment, whatever. Uh, is in better shape than those that didn't do the right thing in hedging risks uh, with Switzerland, for instance. So, so again, we, we haven't done it. Uh, we yes. do see that the shock does have an effect in firms doing less. So when we have, when there is less hedging activity, we do see firms engaging less in this market at the extensive and intensive market. We haven't. It margin. We haven't linked that to actual performance, but but I do want to correct this, which is one thing that we're trying to sell or, or, or position in this paper, is that we need to be careful when we use the right way to hedge, as necessarily these the matching of exports and imports, because it is more complex than we think. In fact, after we found this result that firms are thinking about exports and imports separately, we did talk to firms and banks just to get a sense. And I'm not saying that firms and banks are always doing the right thing. In fact, we as economists tend to think they're not. Um, but many bankers told us that when they have a firm that they say, I'm completely naturally hedged, I'm fine, that they do worry about that firm. Because it's a firm that has not really understood that their payments have different timing. And you may be selling and importing, exporting and importing, but that doesn't necessarily correlate to the day you have an obligation. In fact, tell everyone who has now some products stuck in the Suez Canal, <laughs> if they are not worried about their financial obligations in relation to their actual real obligations. So we do need to worry and perhaps be a little bit more careful that that not all export and import matching is, is the correct. It has to be the timing of the payments of these exports and imports. Uh, but, but to your bigger question, we, we wanna know that, uh, what are the real effects? I, I do wanna pause that it's more complex. And this is also true in the credit literature. In the credit literature, we do know that firms can substitute. If you don't get money from a bank, you can get money from another bank or you can try to find some other sources. And so we, we wanna be careful before we engage into the real effects that these banks are not using credit lines and so on and so forth. That ex ante may be more expensive and does, this is why they're not used, but, but when faced with a, a contingency exposed, that might be the, the way to go. Uh, but again, we haven't done that be, beyond telling you some extensive and intensive implications of, of the, the shock. Thank you. And I was also thinking about how these things could cascade if you have the links within the country, some you, you, you want to repay those that are strong and do not do anything with the weaker ones, which could be the local firms, for instance. There could be some sort of cascade of payment incidents. So in terms of vulnerability, if you wanna start thinking of a central bank, at least we do, so we do know that the large firms are the, the ones that matter in terms of a lot of vulnerability. We do see that those are the ones that are hedging. So, so at least this market is thus, is somehow giving some uh, options for the larger firms. Uh, we, the, the smaller firms don't, don't seem to hedge. Now, again, this can just speak of the, the, the big transaction costs to engage. But, but in most countries and even large ones, are the, uh, you worry more about a systemic crisis coming from large firms not being able to pay than per se small firms being able to pay. And, and so at least in that sense, the data does seem to suggest that financial derivatives are helping a little bit mitigate those risks. I'm just saying that because 
there's the large firm that, are, that may have problems, a way for them to escape these problems would be to, to use their bargaining power, of course, to repay the large, but not the small ones. That's what, uh, what I had in mind. That's what I was referring to okay. cascade within the country. Okay, so, so, the, so again, there is this thing that I, I, small firms go under, that's an easy problem to solve than if large firms go under. But, but you mentioned indirectly another thing that makes the optimality of hedging more complex. The other reason why you may want to hedge or not depends on your market power. So how much you can pass your, your costs to your clients. So one example that is famous is that airlines do not hedge the price of oil. And everyone wonders why the, head, the airlines don't hedge the price of oil. And the reason is when the price of oil goes down, they make that money. And when it goes up, the ticket is more expensive. And so hedging also is related to your market power. And, and we're trying to link also, again, with, with that, as I said, the credit and some sense of market power before we go into real effects, because you can always pass the cost, which is an indirect way of saying what you may have bargaining power with some uh, suppliers or clients. Okay, so we are at uh, 5.15. So uh, I just wanna thank you, Laura, for being with us today for this uh, paper, which is, I think it showed us a lot of cool stuff, but it even opened more door for research and we get a little bit of a flavor uh, towards the end of the discussion. Um, also, thanks to your co-authors, which were uh, with us today. We, we didn't uh, use them. I really want to thank you to Maurice and Iliana. And, um, and to everybody, uh, we look forward to seeing you to the next uh, Geneva Trade and Development Workshop. We will have the next session will be on April 12th. And uh, Jean Grossman will be uh, the presenter. So another uh, great talk. And so bye, uh, everyone. And... Uh, if anybody has comments and questions for Laura, please, uh, you know, email us or email Laura, you, you know where to find her. Um, so thank you very much. Thanks, Laura. Thanks, Laura. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Okay.